everyone. So jumping right in, one of the things that I think is most interesting about the work that you both do is not just that you work in the affordable housing space, it's that you work in this space where there's such vast inequality. So there's a need for affordable housing kind of right up against areas where there is such prolific affluence. So can you talk to me about the unique challenge that you guys have working in a space where you see that inequality? Well, um, Fairfield County in Connecticut is really an area where there is one of the largest opportunity disparities, education achievement gaps, um, income disparities in the nation. And a big challenge for us is how to make those who have the capacity to actually solve the problems aware of what the problems are and how deep they are uh, without necessarily trying to guilt them into solutions because the old sort of forms of, you know, you must be obligated to lift up others works for some, but it doesn't work for everyone. And I think we're in a society where everything is about return on investment. What is the return on your social investment? And we have the privilege, in terms of being a community foundation, of really being a trusted partner that crosses all sectors. We are trusted by the communities that we work and live in. We are trusted by our donors and um, philanthropic partners who trust us to steward their um, their finances. So a big part of it is having, building the reputation, reputational and social capital over time to be able to cross all sectors and have a informed voice, um, but that speaks to and resonates with each aspect of the community. So that's really the starting point. How about you? Well, uh, I can speak to several communities, but I think specifically I'll talk about San Francisco where we're doing some very large scale work trying to, um, representing the Housing Authority and the City of San Francisco to, um, I think the old word might have been redevelop uh, a public housing site and uh, convert what had been 600 units of public housing into 1,500 units of a mixed income community. And this is in the midst of a city that is the highest cost center in America today, where we have um, in a neighborhood adjacent to our development location, our neighborhood, uh, we have multi-million dollar homes. And yet in uh, the Potrero site, we have um, multi-generational families who've been living in public housing uh, making the very lowest of wages, making um, six and seven dollars an hour, um, or not at all, receiving public assistance. So I think that what we have are people who go by each other, um, tech people, people who are making lots of money, young people who are making lots of money, and walking through the community and the city and not really noticing people who have been living there people who have been living there sort of walking by and being focused on day-to-day um, you know, -day struggles and not really being able to integrate or, or interact or even um, get a leg up uh, with the, amidst the other prosperity. And you're talking about a large metropolitan area. Bridgeport is the largest city in the state of Connecticut and its population is 160,000, which seems very small. But that said, we have exactly the same challenge. And what the Community Foundation has done, we've been working with a particular public housing unit in Bridgeport that houses about 350 families, representing uh, nearly uh, 1,500 you know, individuals. And it's exactly the same challenge. The way this public housing unit was built, um, it is next to an industrial area. It is, it is invisible. I mean, part of it is it is invisible for the residents who live in the wealthier communities of, of Fairfield County. So a big part of that is really uh, shedding a light on that. And what we were able to do, we started off with the proposition that how do we reduce the recidivism rate and, and help make these more stable environments, this public housing unit. 
we have come all the way from that initial premise, which was really quite successful. It started out with a stable families program, and we were able to get the retention rate up to 96%, and then decided that that really wasn't enough. It's really about how do you empower the residents of that community to create the type of community that they want to live in, that we would want to live in. So we've really moved from a very narrow definition of what the problem was to a much broader um, sustainable systemic solution of, of how do you cre help the residents themselves create the vision for their own community. Right. Cynthia, you touched on something that I actually want to talk about a bit, which is mixed use um, living, mixed use buildings. And I'm not sure how many people heard of what kind of seemed like a bit of a nightmarish example in New York where there was affordable housing within a larger building and they had what they were calling a poor door. Um, and it sounded pretty awful, yet when the building went to market, there were a ton of people who applied for that affordable housing section, of course, because New York real, real estate is really difficult to come by. So I guess what I want to know from you two is how much interest do you see on both sides um, for this type of mixed use living? and what would a successful example of that look like, and are you seeing more of those? Sure. Well, I represent a nonprofit that does a lot of development work, and um, so we work in the built environment, and, and we also work with mixed populations all the time. Um, I watched the uh, poor door concept uh, be introduced in New York, and am doing. We're doing a very similar development in San Francisco that will be 40 stories that will also have a mixed income population, um, we would not do a poor door. Um, we believe very strongly that you have to integrate. And if we don't, I mean, we're not fulfilling the promise of America. And we will just, uh, despite the fact that that particular development, when opened, got a large response, I think that is um, due to the cost of housing in New York and not really uh, necessarily going to be an indication of the success of that neighborhood, that community, long term. And we've actually not focused on housing itself. The whole concept of the Community Foundation is that it is place-based, and it's very focused on the place, the geographic area. Where we add some value is because we also look at regional solutions and connecting not only some of the challenges that are being faced by Bridgeport and the urban areas, but where, what do they have in common in terms of cross-border town challenges. Uh, so when we approach this, as I said, it started out as how do we help reduce the recidivism rate? But what we very quickly realized is that these residents of this community and really needed, um, they needed support in terms of job education and training, in terms of health and safety, and with respect to um, workforce development and job training. And their first priority was not job training or education. Their first priority was safety mm -hmm. and how to reduce the rate of crime and violence. This particular public housing unit, 93% of the residents are single female household heads. Mm -hmm. And a major 80% of the crime in that neighborhood is domestic violence. So if, you're, so if we're not addressing all of the factors, mental health issues, domestic violence, uh, education, uh, preschool, preparation, skills training, then we're really not empowering that community to move forward. And I think that's where philanthropy is starting to get smarter because we tended to go with very uh, single focused programs. But if you're not addressing the entire environment that that family is in and all of its problems, then you're not really helping them to move forward and transform their lives for the next generation. I, I, I completely agree with you. And I think that we're working sort of on a parallel track. Um, we, um, at the Petrero site, which I'll talk about again, um, we've been in that neighborhood for five years. And now in year six, we're going to break ground. So we're really seeing um, a lot of um, change take place internal to the neighborhood. And a lot of that has been by working with the community and helping to design um, more of an introduction to how to get ready uh, and how to have a more um, 
be more opportunistic toward accepting um, this potential prosperity. So um, I want to give a couple of examples. I've been at Bridge for five years now, so I stepped in just as we started this project. And we decided to take a pretty holistic approach. So we brought in community people that worked in the neighborhood as we started the, just the development process, which is you know, the entitlements of permitting the design, making the neighborhood, uh, including the wealthy neighborhood that surrounds it, uh, aware and appreciative of the design, but then also looking with the neighborhood that we're transforming and trying to help people get ready. I saw a lot of things go on in this neighborhood. We've got drugs. Um, I remember about the first year, we had a phone call from a woman who was on the site. She said we had a drive-by shooting. We had a two-year-old shot. Uh, the family, which was a single mother, uh, with a grandfather living at home and large, uh, large-scale extended family, didn't want to stay there. And so um, needing to work with the Public Housing Authority to see if we could move them, and this is you know, sort of bouncing up against a bureaucracy, which all bureaucracies uh, throughout the country are very similar. Well, there's waiting lists. Well, there's trauma. There's violence. Um, so when people have that kind of an environment where they're living with that type of trauma, what, we've, what we believe and what we've been working on is something we're calling trauma-informed community development, which sounds kind of wild, but it's really thinking about what's different between you and I and that person who's been raised in this environment. And the fact is, is that if you're living in that environment, you're constantly exposed to trauma. It's very much like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. There's always violence going on. You're always watching your back. And so how do you think about taking advantage of a, uh, a single-purpose program, right. like a health clinic? There's a health clinic nearby. Nobody goes to it. Um, how do you get kids to school uh, when just walking through the neighborhood can become quite dangerous? So working with the community, we came up with a lot of different ideas, one of which is the walking school bus, where volunteers who live in the neighborhood walk their kids every day to school through the neighborhood. And every day, the crowd gets bigger and bigger. And we're seeing a lot more attendance in school where we were seeing a lot of um, absenteeism. Exactly. Where um, just having regular things happen every day, people can look forward to, and they're positive, so that they know that it's much more normal. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's really hard to just plop people down in the middle of something that would be uh, considered to be a prosperous or regular neighborhood integrated with different incomes without really getting ready to expect the positive. Right. So that's part of the work we're doing. And those are very similar challenges. One of the things, when we started this relationship, it was a partnership the Community Foundation is really the quarterback for this entire um, initiative. And it was a partnership between the residents, the Bridgeport Housing Authority. We now have uh, 12 partners, including early child care developers, uh, community health clinic, uh, food providers, uh, people who are teaching about nutrition and safety, job training and skills programs, partnerships with uh, community college, um, a state college, as well as the Yale Con Consultation Services. So it has become um, a real collaborative effect with all of the people coming together. The challenge in that is that it's all about relationship building yeah. and building that trust mm -hmm. that those service providers and partners were, are really looking for the best interest of residents. And when you're working in this field, turnover is a significant challenge. You know, there's very little stability, either in terms of the, the, um, the public sector and public policy people, or even the very institutions that are providing the services. So you have to bring an institutional trust and understanding to have people who have been so disrespected um, develop that confidence that they, they can trust others to work with them 
and to not work with them in such a way that they're just further um, at, you know, deepening the problems and deepening the mistrust that, that, uh, that caused a lot of the problems in the first place. And is there a way that you think that your organization is being particularly proactive about it, or a way that other organizations can be proactive about dealing with that? I think we've been particularly proactive because we understand we work with the faith-based communities. We work with the grassroots organizations. We work with the service providers themselves. We have a, um, a community organizer as the project director, so it, the whole principle is all about community empowerment. What, what I brought out here is the PT Partners, by the way, is, has now become the name of this collaboration. And the partners themselves have drafted their own strategic plan from 2015 to, to 2017. And in the partnership, the residents themselves have 51% of the voting power for anything that happens. And they have articulated what their vision is and what their goals are and how their operating principles are going to work and what their goals are for this year versus the next. And they will take it back to their steering committee for approval of this. But what started out as a partnership of two or three is now 12 official partners, i.e. memorandums of understanding and articulated you know, goals for the relationship. And then they have another 36 that they call uh, supporting partners. And those could be grocery stores. or So it has really taken root. Um, and what, what we've seen is the leaders have confidence that they are going to be in control of their own destiny. And they've cleaned up the neighborhood, the community center that used to be just you know empty. It's always thriving because they do preschool programs, after school programs. Um, mm -hmm. It, it has become, they have become a community that trusts each other as well as um, others. So that's the beauty of it. And I just have one more question for you guys. What, so what does the future of affordable housing look like to you guys? We've talked a lot about community. We've talked a lot about the need for it to be holistic. We've also talked about the fact that it's a process. Um, and we know that around the country, rent prices are climbing significantly. Housing prices are rising, which means it's harder to, for some groups to create this type of affordable living situation. It's also harder for people to find places that they can afford on their own. So how do we match up the slowness of supply with the increasing demand? Well, I think we need policy makers to start changing some of the zoning laws. I know at least we do where we are. And there is a whole movement along um, called Tiny Homes where particularly young people are looking for smaller spaces or collaborative and communal, communal spaces to take the, pr the price of, of affordable housing down. But that's going to involve zoning law changes, policy and advocacy changes, and an openness to creating different types of living models, not just for the developers, but also for the residents themselves. Yeah, I, I think that there isn't any one answer. We have an incredible uh, imbalance of housing and, um, and, and affordability throughout the country, and in particular in areas like yours, areas in the West Coast where I'm working. And um, we are uh, increasingly becoming more and more resource constrained. Certainly zoning is one of the issues. Uh, having acceptance in the communities is another. It's kind of part and parcel of the same. New techniques of building. We're doing modular homes mm -hmm. now. So I think there's just a whole bunch of different things. But I will agree with this. The policymakers need to step up because we are seeing more and more examples. Um, what happened in Baltimore, and I was just there last week, this week, um, but, you know, and has been happening throughout the country is also uh, you know, a reaction to, you know, lack of work, lack of being respected, lack of understanding and tolerance for each other. Um, and I think that we're going to have to start with making sure that people do have a stable place to live. Um, and just... Um, by changing the way public housing has been operating, which is one of the things that we're doing, is not enough. It's, it's a, there's a lot more, and it's, it also starts with the neighborhood and the community itself. Right. I think we have time for some questions. 
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Camila Martin Proctor. I'm with the President's National Council on Disability. Thank you so much for being here and having this forum. I guess my question um, wraps around the whole issue of design. I'm sure, as you know, that there is a lack of accessible, affordable housing for individuals living with various levels of disability. Is there a conversation happening with regards to the design of these homes to make them accessible? Maybe I'll take that because I'm the developer. <laughs> um, I believe it. Uh, I, I mean, I think that having accessible housing has got to be, uh, you know, every everybody's obligation, and we certainly try to do that in everything that we do design itself. Um, not everyone is doing that, but obviously with um, ADA and, and changes that have occurred, more people are, are taking a look at it and obligated to do it. But um, our philosophy is uh, to always build green, always build accessible. And I'd actually like to advise you to check out a website, tinyhomes.org, in terms of some of the creativity that's going on in, in housing design. Um, and it, it's really quite fascinating what people can do with very little space um, and still really make it attractive. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, I, yep. Hi, Steve Chisholm with the Chisholm Group. Thanks, Steve, for doing this again and the great work that you guys are doing. I applaud both right. of your efforts. I got it on my neck and here. <laughs> and I'm telling everybody about it because if I, if I whack, if I, if I go totally crazy, I want you to know. What is it? Uh, anyway, I'll just, just, just touch briefly. Just touch briefly on, and I know it's kind of the elephant in the room, but can you just touch a little bit about the NIMBY issue and a little about um, which I know is not the focus of today, on the homeless issue. I ran, Steve knows, the Homeless Veterans pro Program here in Washington for years. But what the intersection of where affordable housing meets, and I applaud your tiny uh, housing movement, which is a, it's a, a large cause, you know, and you're doing a wonderful job. I applaud your work. But can you touch on the NIMBY issue and the homeless issue? As we all know, homeless percent, if you believe the Interagency Council, the, the numbers are slightly down, but homeless veterans is spiking, male greater than ever. And I was wondering if you could touch on the intersection of the movements that you're both doing on both coasts, um, but how you think the NIMBY and the homeless and the homeless veterans issue specifically fits into those areas in the NIMBY issue. I, I, I was in um, our opening that we had for a, a, a development that we've been working on in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago. We'd been working on that project for quite a while also, and it was a collaboration with ourselves with Bridge Housing and. Um, school district, LAUSD, and we opened um, 140 units of housing, beautiful, gorgeous development right on an old school site with an operating high school, uh, and gave um, kind of preference to the district employees. Uh, we had um, nearly 7,300 <coughs> applications for those units of housing, so I mean it was incredibly overwhelming for our staff to sift through those. and. Uh, through a lottery system, um, we're able to select uh, some of the homeowners or some of the um, people who would be moving into the homes. There, it's rental housing. And I met a woman there who uh, had worked for the district. She was just moved in. She was incredibly fortunate, she said, and blessed uh, to be moving in and had been working for the school district for 10 years. And she told me that she had... Um, had two children, they were in the school. They, um, uh, she worked at their, dis at their school, it was a middle school site, um, and that her husband had died uh, about a year before and she had lost her home. She'd been living in a homeless shelter for the last seven months um, and now was fortunate enough to be living in this unit. This is a, you know, a very put together, attractive woman who's a fabulous mother, you could tell, and she was crying, I was crying. Um, that's the face of homelessness today. In Los Angeles, there are 58,000 homeless people. Um, so it's not, um, the numbers are not necessarily going down in all markets. Um, NIMBYs need to meet that lady. That's right. And you know, we, we have actually also been involved in and started an affordable housing collaborative uh, 10 years ago 
We continue to be the lead funder in that. It is a collaborative of private and public developers, um, community organizations, um, and, and in our track record, we've uh, either built or refurbished 1,500 affordable units. We have 5,000 more people in homes um, as a result of this. But we continue to be the lead partner, and we would like to see more businesses and developers uh, take on a, a, a bigger, bigger lift in terms of that particular effort on our part. So anyone wanted to ask a last question? Right in the middle, over there. Good afternoon. Thank you for sharing all of your insights. My name is Melanie Avery, and I'm with Veterans on the Rise, Inc. here in DC. Uh, we are servicing homeless veterans and veteran families. I'm just interested in your thoughts on how you went about uh, building more of those partnerships with larger organizations who may not necessarily understand sort of the plight of these homeless folks, the folks that have the mental health disorders, the folks that really don't uh, sit in the same chairs, go to the same places. We've been very successful at helping veterans reintegrate into the community, giving them those social experiences. But I guess it's a two-part question. How have you been able to really engage these larger groups outside of the development space? Yes. And then also, what are you seeing is the best way to sort of reintegrate these folks into their communities? Is it housing first? Is it transition? Is it wraparound services? What has been your experience? I think it's all of the above. We've been able to um, engage some of these larger partnerships because we have a whole portfolio of work that we do. We publish, we do research, and we publish. Um, at least two or three thought leadership papers a year on various topics that are of deep interest to the community. We have community conversations and convenings where we bring public officials, private sector, grassroots people together um, around particular issues and conversations. We have that permission to go across sectors and invite people around the table who normally do not ever have that opportunity to interact with each other because of you know, living in their own silos. So we use all of those tools to start those conversations, to raise the awareness. And again, because of our own reputation as a, an advisor and collaborator and convener, that's how we make those connections with each other. But it is long, long, heavy lifting. It is not short-term return on investment. It's really investing in the relationships and the conversations and bringing that together over time. I think I would say that thank heavens that we're starting to realize the plight of uh, ve returning veterans and that many of them are traumatized and have, um, had, had, have been dislocated and disenfranchised and unable to really um, access all of the services. And again, I think you have to have a stable place to live. So uh, we are seeing more and more resources come to that. I agree, you have to be collaborative. You have to work with everybody and across uh, silos and across um, different partnerships, but I think you have to recognize the problem first and um, understand that it is a multidisciplined approach. All right, I think that's all we have time for. Thank you both so much for participating. Thank you. Thank you.